Next case, 09-0088, State of Ohio versus George D. Williams. Ms. Sudi? Madam Chief Justice O'Connor, and may it please the court. Counsel. My name is Catherine Zudi, and I represent the defendant appellant, Mr. George Williams. At this time, I would like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Today, this court must determine whether the state and federal bans on ex post facto laws prohibit the retroactive application of Senate Bill 10. My client, George Williams, stands convicted of one count of unlawful sexual conduct with a minor, the result of his admission and plea of guilty to engaging in sexual conduct with his 14-year-old girlfriend. Mr. Williams was 19 years old. And at that time, in May 2007, House Bill 180 required that, absent clear and convincing evidence to the contrary, a person convicted of this crime and under these circumstances must be labeled a sexually oriented offender. A sexually oriented offender classification requires the offender to report once a year for 10 years. Yet, through the enactment of Senate Bill 10, my client and others similarly situated are subject to more than double the length of their registration requirements. Under Senate Bill 10, not only have the temporal length of registration been enhanced, but also the severity and number of restraints attendant to that registration have been markedly increased. So, Council, we are precluded from applying Bodike here because of the fact that he was, this is operation of law that uh, uh, designated your client. Is that correct? Correct, Your Honor. And also, Mr. Williams never had a House Bill 180 classification. His tier classification was an original classification as he was sentenced after January 1st of 2008, although his crime occurred in May of 2007. But you're saying that he should have been uh, classified pursuant to the state of the law in 2007? Correct. Based on the prohibition against Ohio's retroactivity clause in the United States Supreme Court's... And according to the date of the crime, what would his classification have been? Sexually oriented offender? A sexually oriented offender, correct, Your Honor. And he didn't need a hearing in order to be classified as a sexually oriented offender. That was operation of law, correct? Correct. And that's the sticking point from applying Bodike in your view? Correct. So there's no way that we could expand Bodike to include uh, operation of law um, classified? If this court would decide to do so, it, there, Mr. Williams would have no objection to that. However, my understanding is, as the Attorney General has been applying State versus Bodike, nobody who is by operation of law under the previous law has had a, quote, final adjudication. So State versus Bodike may not be applied to anybody who does not actually have a journal entry mandating that this person was, was actually classified as a sexually oriented offender. So you're, you're only left with the ex post facto um, argument here because of our statements or our, our perspective that Bodeck is based on a separation of powers Correct. argument. Correct. Mm -hmm. right. And the ex post facto is squarely um, addressed in the issue of whether this is punishment or not punishment. And I know we have the Bodeck case, but can you distinguish it? Is this, a, is this a, 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 an issue that should be put to rest and not considered by this court? Or is there a reason for this court to squarely consider whether uh, the statute has devolved or evolved, devolved into uh, criminal punishment rather than a civil remedy? Absolutely. Absolutely. There is pending legislation in the General Assembly, House Bill 77, requesting that trial courts actually bring back anybody who was adjudicated under House Bill 180 or Senate Bill 5, and for the trial courts to revisit their prior judgments so that everybody may now once again be reclassified under Senate Bill 10. So it is necessary for this court to draw a line and 
say that Senate Bill 10 has evolved into punishment. Council, in that regard, um, I understand only about four or five states um, have enacted um, these um, requirements that Congress wrote into their their law. Yes, sir. Um, have any of those uh, reached a final determination on the issue of whether the um, registration requirements uh, are punitive? Nevada is the only jurisdiction that has thus far determined that its state's uh, regarding its state's application of the federal Adam Walsh Act is a violation of the ex post facto and its state's constitution. But Indiana has, Indiana, Alaska, and Maine have ordered that their Megan's Law legislation is actually a violation of the ex post facto or its own state's constitutions. So while one state has actively said that its state's application of the Adam Walsh Act is a violation of its state's or the United States Constitution. Three other states have said that its state's legislation regarding the regarding Megan's Act is also unconstitutional. And Megan's law is less draconian than the Adam Walsh yes. Act. Yes. So really four states have gone on record as saying this this would be a criminal yes. law, not a civil law. Yes. Has there been any litigation involving the federal act itself? Not that I know of, Your Honor. Council, to get where you would have us go, it's really not necessary to overrule Cook, is it? it we Absolutely sim not. We simply say this is now a bridge too far. Absolutely. Senate Bill 10 is very different from the legislation that was at issue in State versus Cook. Senate Bill 10 imposes burdens on defendants that have historically been regarded as punishment and operate as affirmative disabilities and restraints. Mm -hmm. The registration and reporting scheme, as it stands now under Senate Bill 10, is virtually indistinguishable from post-release control, community control, and other forms of supervised release, which have traditionally been considered punishment for criminal acts. Council, oh, excuse me, Council, the, the states that have already ruled the way they have, did they all analyze the Kennedy-Mendoza factors? Yes. And this, the majority in, in Bodite did not do that. We did not look at those factors no, Your Honor. insofar as whether this would be civil or criminal. No, Your Honor. Okay. In State v. Cook, this court noted that House Bill 180's registration requirements were not difficult. Offenders had to register only with their county sheriff and provide a current home address, the name and address of the offender's employer, and a photograph. Now, post-Cook and as mandated by Senate Bill 10, registration duties are more demanding. Persons classified as sex offenders must register with the sheriff of the counties in which they reside, work, and go to school. Also, a sheriff is now permitted to request that a sex offender's landlord or the manager of the sex offender's residence verify that the sex offender resides at that registered address. While protection of the public is an avowed goal of Revised Code Chapter 2950, severe obligations are imposed upon those classified as sex offenders. So, Council, are you um, bothered by the, the number of people that are going to know and verify that the defendant is a sex offender, a convicted sex offender, or the duration of the, uh, um, the registration requirement? The intense effects test has seven factors. So none of those individual characteristics by themselves indicate that Senate Bill 10 has been transformed into punitive legislation. However, each of these factors taken together is what amounts to punishment. So it's not the fact alone that under Senate Bill 10, registrants are required to provide their social security number, any aliases, any email addresses, any license plate number of vehicles that are owned by, registered to, or regularly available to the defendant. It is not any of that individually that amounts to Senate Bill 10 being transformed into punishment. But it is those factors, along with the fact that Senate Bill 10 requires all of that information to be open to the public, along with the fact that Senate Bill 10's scope is excessive in relation to any non-punitive interest. So, well, basically, though, if we do declare that this is punitive, um, 
it's not punitive. Its application going forward is not going to be a problem. That it's is just the application to non bodike uh, defendants who are within this window of um, sentencing prior to uh, a crime committed post Senate Bill 10. And not only in that window, but there are other defendants who had been subject to House Bill 180. But however, some of them have not had not actually received a four corner final adjudication. And those offenders who even have been registering as a sexually oriented offender for maybe the past three years, because they do not have that four corner final adjudication, Senate Bill 10 is still being applied to them. And also potentially any legislation that the General Assembly has going forward in the future, like House Bill 77 regarding ordering trial courts to reopen their own final adjudications, this could potentially apply to them also. Along with being analogous to historical forms of punishment, Senate Bill 10 also furthers the traditional aims of punishment, retribution and deterrence. Senate Bill 10 determines who must register based not on an individualized assessment of the risk that the person poses to society, but rather on the criminal statute that the person was convicted of violating. But that in itself is not punitive, is it? No, Your Honor. That is just yet another factor that weighs in favor of this court finding that Senate Bill 10 is now punitive. Do you, um, do you uh, assert that this bill has no uh, remedial effect uh, at all, um, no, no benefit to the public in terms of uh, public safety and awareness. I know you argue that it's ineffective in some cases at least, but do you contend that it has no beneficial effect? Senate Bill 10 does purport to adv advance a legitimate regulatory purpose, the purpose of protecting the public from dangerous sexual offenders. However, the issue here in terms of the intense effects test is whether the scope of Senate Bill 10 exceeds that purpose. And Senate Bill 10 makes information on all sex offenders available to the general public without restriction and without regard as to whether the individual actually poses any particular future risk to society. And contrary to the common misconception, the recidivism rate for sex crimes is no worse than the recidivism rate for other crimes. And counsel, this was a relationship as, as offensive as, as we may find, or particularly those of us with teenage daughters, these two young people were engaged in a relationship. This was not um, a forcible rape, even though it was deemed unlawful. Correct. Had she been one year older, it would have been within the four year um, that the legislature has passed, it would not have Correct. deemed it a felony. Correct. So in this case, as applied, there is no public safety component here. Correct, but also to any individual who perhaps had that class or who was supposed to have had that classification under House Bill 180, those people, those individuals were never afforded the opportunity to perhaps provide the court with information that they were not sexual predators or then automatically placed into Tier 3. What had happened when Senate Bill 10 was reclassifying any, everybody when uh, the, the Attorney General was sending out those letters. A lot of people who were classified as sexually oriented offenders were automatically placed into Tier 3. So again, the particular future risk that the person poses to society is not to be considered, which is another factor which gives more weight to the argument that Senate Bill 10 is certainly excessive in regarding its purpose to protect society. Uh, is it your view that it, it, your, your challenge is a facial challenge to all Senate Bill 10 uh, parameters? Correct. Senate Bill uh, 10. In response to the Chief Justice's question, you said that going forward, there was no problem with the application of 10, and it was only as applied to those similarly situated to your client. I'm sorry, I, understand, I, I misunderstood your Honor's question. In, in, in a broad application, Senate Bill 10 may not be applied to anybody retroactively, but going forward prospectively, that is not the issue in this case. So are you going as far as to say that or, or not? I just want to make sure we understand the scope of what you're saying. Are you saying that this entire scheme is part of the sentencing process or should be considered part of the sentencing process, subject solely to the control of the judge, 
or do we still have it as a somewhat of an, a hybrid where it has punitive aspects but it is separate from sentencing itself? The way that the legislation is written, even in Senate Bill 10, trial courts are supposed to give the offender his or her categorization and classification at sentencing. And the legislation has not written this to be anything but a part of the offender's sentence. So House Bill 180, however, although some portions are analogous in that the offender still had to be given his or her classification or adjudication as a part of his or her sentence and at the time of sentencing, there are so many differences between Senate Bill 10 and the prior legislation, which has now transformed Senate Bill 10 into being legislation that is punitive in nature. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Greer. Madam Chief, Chief Justice, and may it please the court, I am Michael Greer. Would you pull your microphone up there? Thank you. I apologize, Your Honor. My name is Michael Greer. I'm with the Warren County Prosecutor's Office, and I represent the state today. This is Mr. David M. Lieberman uh, with the Ohio Attorney General's Office, and he will be sharing my time today. I would like to reserve seven and a half minutes for Mr. Lieberman. Your Honors, Senate Bill 10 does not violate the ex post facto law calls of the United States Constitution, nor does it violate Section 28, Article 2 of the Ohio Constitution. The appellant believes that Senate Bill 10 is now a criminal and punitive statute because it no longer requires or allows a trial court to engage in an individualized assessment of the risk of recidivism before classifying a convicted sex offender. The United States Supreme Court addressed this very issue in Smith v. Doe in 2003. As a matter of fact, Alaska's sex offender law at the time was remarkably similar to Senate Bill 10 that exists today. The U.S. Supreme Court analyzed, uh, analyzed whether such a scheme calls sex offender registry laws to violate ex post facto. The Supreme Court determined that the ex post facto clause does not prevent a state legislature from making reasonable categorical judgments regarding convictions of certain specified crimes. Well, counsel, the, if I understand the argument, it is that the smorgasbord of things that are going to happen to a defendant puts this now, uh, it's much expanded from the uh, prior law, which I guess people want to call them by names, and so they called it Megan's Law. Um, that the expansion of the things that happen to a defendant put it in the category of punishment. And, and that, um, so going forward, forward, the legislature can punish crimes as it sees fit, basically, as long as it isn't cruel and unusual. So going forward, all these things that have been added on, imposed by the judge, at sentencing would be okay, but to apply them retroactively would, would not. Isn't that simply what we have to decide? Well, Your Honor, Megan's Law, let's, let's start with a brief discussion of Megan's Law. Megan's Law required two things of, sex, of convicted sex offenders. One, an initial registration, and then two, a periodic verification of certain, of certain information. Now, that information that was acquired at the initial registration fell into basically five categories. You have personal identifiers. You had to have a name. You had residential information. You had to give your current residential address. Contact information. Once more, the current address. Employment information. You, the, the sex offender had to give their current employee's, employer's name and address. They also had to give educational information if they were in school or if they went and attended an institute of higher learning. And, and certain sex offenders, sexual predators, had to give vehicular information. Now, Senate Bill 10 requires the same categories of information. Now, it requires more information in each of those categories. 
personal identifiers, it requires names, it requires aliases, it requires a social security number, date of birth. Now, that's very reasonable. As a matter of fact, probably should have been included in Megan's law. I mean, we don't want to confuse Mr. George no, D. But Williams. But if it had been included in Megan's law, we might have made a different call on whether or not it was punitive. But I don't think you would have. Because well, you, this information how do, how do you is. Know? In, I don't know that we know. I sure don't know. But this information, this additional information, is necessary to carry out the goal of Senate Bill 10. Which Let me ask you this. Um, George Williams engaged in consensual sex with a girl that was too young, right? That's what he did. He engaged in, well, he engaged in sex with a, with a girl who was legally incapable of consenting, Your Honor. Right. If, I, if this law is applied to him and I pull up the uh, Warren County uh, Sheriff's uh, website, what will I see? You'll see his name. You'll and? See, you'll see his address. And? You'll see physical descriptions such as tattoos, if he has any. And? You'll see the name of his employer. And? And I believe you'll see his address. And? You may see the name of the, the description of his vehicles. And? Um, I'm not sure after that. His photograph. Yes, you will see a picture of him. Yes. And that will go on for how long? That will go on for 25 years, Your Honor. Counsel, you've had four or five state Supreme Courts find that this law has now become punitive, or even the earlier version, Megan's, is punitive. Does Ohio have the ability under our Constitution to find a different standard than the U.S. Supreme Court? It would under its retroactive, under the, the ban on retroactive, retroactive laws found in the Ohio Constitution. There, but the thing is, there's no cases specifically stated that the ban on retroactive laws grants greater protection than the ex post facto clause of the United States Constitution. But we this could find in our Constitution that that right, does, that that right exists? There's nothing to prohibit us from finding differently than the Supreme Court case you've cited. Uh, would you please... You've, you cited us a U.S. Supreme Court case yes. that says this is, this is constitutional. We've got four or five state Supreme Courts that said it's not. Yes, is sure. there anything that prohibits us from finding differently than the U.S. Supreme Court? Only this court's reasoning in Cook and in Ferguson. And I wrote Cook. And I also joined a dissent on the recent cases. I understand, Your Honor. But I believe this, this court... The, the, this court's reasons in Cook and in Ferguson still apply to this type of, to Senate Bill 10. Senate Bill 10 has not changed substantially from Megan's law. That's, I think, a point of d d contention in this case. And I understand, Your Honor, but the thing is, personally, I, I don't see this. Counsel, how many um, states have adopted Megan's law when it was the, and, and still have Megan's law? Isn't it all, pretty much all 50, all 50 states? All 50 states. All right. And um, there's only been, well, Ohio was the first for the Adam Walsh Act. Uh, has there been other states that have adopted it? Ohio, Florida, I believe Wyoming, and I want to say Tennessee, but I'm, I, I'm but not, not sure. But not the version that Ohio has, correct? I couldn't tell you. I have not reviewed all right, their so, laws. So 46 other states decide that the Megan's or the Adam Walsh Act provisions uh, are not, as a policy, um, good for their states, and they're satisfied with the Megan's law. Would that be a conclusion that could be reasonably drawn here? No, I think that's a speculation. It's quite possible that, that we have right now, uh, I see that I've gone over my time, but to answer your question, I don't think so. I think that's merely speculation. It could be that state legislatures right now are slowly enacting, working through their, their own legislative process, a, a version of the federal Adam Walsh Act. But as we are here today, we've got about four states that go with the Adam Walsh Act and 46 other states that say, no, no thanks. Not yet. Okay. You've used your time. Thank you, Your Honor.
Mr. Lieberman, you have about six minutes. So let me use a couple of those uh, six minutes by asking this question. Uh, yes, Your Honor. I mean, your argument is that uh, this is still uh, remedial and, and civil. Uh, what set of facts would push it over the line into uh, punitive? I think if the General Assembly started going past the markers that this court set down in the trilogy of cases, um, Cook, Williams, Ferguson, and indeed Bodike. So take the registration period, for instance. Senate Bill 10's top registration period is a quarterly registration requirement with the county sheriff, um, four times a year with the sheriff of the residents and the employer. Um, that was the same uh, provision that this court reviewed in Ferguson and ultimately upheld. If, this, if the General Assembly were to uh, increase that number to, let's say, monthly or six times a year, uh, we would not have that important precedent to rely on. We would be, be in uncharted territory. Council, it's not just one sheriff, though, correct? If the individual is working somewhere, uh, is residing somewhere, goes out uh, uh, traveling somewhere, we're talking about all those different sheriffs reporting, correct? Yes, Your Honor. The, um, an individual must register with the county of his residence, the county of his employer, and if he's attending school full-time, the county of his educational institution. And it would be every 90 days for those individuals For a well. Tier 3 offender. That was the same provision um, that this court reviewed in Ferguson, uh, that we, the Senate Bill 5 in 2003 added those additional re uh, duties, um, and then Senate Bill 10 did not change those. And Ms. Mr. Lieberman, we never looked at the Kennedy-Mendoza factors uh, in any of those cases that you've talked about, all the factors that um, your opposing counsel had listed in terms of whether there was an intent to punish, just as, a, as opposed to the label of something being called civil or remedial. I think that the, it's fair to say that the court walked through the different Kennedy factors, not just in Cook, um, but in Ferguson, because the court has adopted those factors as the test to decide whether or not something is civil, remedial, or criminal and punitive. Um, in, let me um, sort of go off on the colloquy that uh, Justice Pfeiffer had uh, with co-counsel as to what Senate Bill 10 has added. And the, the items that I have marked on my sheet here, um, the, the registration period, the top one is four times a year. We ha that was under Megan's law. That was the top tier under Megan's law. It is still the top tier under Senate Bill 10. Counsel, the count let me uh, stop you there. Um, <laughs> you, you all look at this and say, well, you, you, you Cook, you flashed a green light. Um, I can't speak for anyone else, but I'm, I'm coming to regret my vote in, in Cook because it, it seems like the legislature has treated it exactly as that. It said, well, you gave us this much rope. Let's see how much more we can take. And, and, and just keeps moving the ball on down the line and saying, oh, we can go back on this defendant, that defendant. Uh, they could start in on another type of crime and say, well, let's, let's add a few more things that we want these people to do that they weren't told and wasn't a part of their sentence, but now let's tack it on. I, I disagree with that premise, Your Honor. Uh, and I, an example I can give is the community notification requirement of Senate Bill 10. Not only is that uh, really mirrors the old Megan's Law provision, it's actually even more tailored than the community notification provision in Megan's Law because it gives uh, new discretion to the trial courts under 29.50.11F2 to suspend a community notification requirement for any Tier 3 offender, reclassified or going forward. That is a new innovation. And the other items that um, opposing counsel mentioned, uh, the website, the, webs the Attorney General's Internet uh, website, that was in existence um, before Senate Bill 10, um, the individual's picture and its physical description and the identity of his crime were all posted up there. Um, and then, and so with Mr. Williams, the identity of the crime will be rape, right? No, it, it, I believe his crime was uh, unlawful conduct with a minor, not rape. Okay, but but will it say that? Or will yes. It, will, but, it, will, it, will it cite a code section? It will identify the nature of the offense and cite the code section. The same is true if uh, under Megan's law. That type of information was on the, the website, and also it's a matter of public record. And, uh, and so in many respects, in the items that opposing counsel has mentioned, those were already in wide effect. Oh, when he's tw when he tw that's, it's 25 years he has to be registered, Correct. Right? So 20 years from now, when he's 45, 
it's going to say unlawful conduct with a minor. And they're going to assume he's a 45-year-old having an unlawful conduct, conduct with a minor? No, because uh, the, the website also d identifies the date of offense, primarily for that purpose to uh, sort out uh, for the public so who has look, committed a recent... you have to look at this and you have to say, okay, how old was he? Does it tell you how old is he when he did this? I believe that all that information is on there, Your Honor. So somebody's got to sit down there with a calculator and figure out his age and make sure that this was actually two young kids, not some older adult doing a doing it with a minor? I, 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 given the display that is currently listed on the website, I don't think that information it will be very hard to divine. The major innovation mm -hmm. of Senate Bill 10 was the automatic classification scheme, which has been a, f a facet of sex offender laws in Ohio going back to 1963. Is that there was, anything in the, if we, if we find that this is legitimate, is there anything to prevent the legislature from adding murderers? Uh, to this crime, adding somebody who commits uh, aggravated robbery to, to the database? Is uh, there anything that prevents Well, cer that? certainly not this database. It would, I, I, I mean, I'd, I don't want to speculate on what uh, additional legislation that the General Assembly could come up with. But the court would have, if there is a, such a case, the court would uh, evaluate it under its well-worn factors and um, I'd be happy to stand up here and, and try to defend that law. Um, the, the Attorney General's position here is that this case simply fits into the four corners of the precedents that this court has already established. Before you sit down, Mr. Lieberman, I was trying to make a list of what I thought was your argument as to the comparison of the requirements of Senate Bill 10 as to what had been the law under Senate Bill 5. Mm -hmm. And I have noted the registration requirement, community notification, the website, and were there others that you were going to articulate for us? Yes, for instance, uh, all of these were outlined in the, the, this court's decision in Ferguson, uh, which summarized the Megan's Law in existence as of 2007 or 2008. And so, for instance, under that version of Megan's Law, all this information was, a matter, not all of the information, but most of the information was subject to public record. Um, that provision has carried over under Senate Bill 10. Um, we have not added uh, anything new on that end. Um, the main... Basically, the public information that is being uh, grouped together and put on a website is, it's just, I guess, easier now for a member of the public to bring up Mr. Williams' name on the registry and then find all the information in one neat little package as opposed to having to go look at, you know, the docket or, um, you know, any other search tool to determine where he lives, what he does, that sort of thing. That's correct, Your Honor, but that it was an innovation of, of, in 2003, the website has been in existence, was in existence before Senate Bill 5. The same type of information was uh, displayed. I think there's only been a few minor additions to the website mm -hmm. after Senate Bill 5. Uh, and so in that respect, this law is remarkably similar to the old law that this court reviewed in Ferguson. But wouldn't Megan's law have allowed the judge to have greater discretion? I mean, clearly, the Adam Walsh Act was not meant to capture a, a defendant like this. This kid is 19 years old. Wouldn't the judge have had greater discretion under Senate Bill 180? Under Senate Bill 180, the, his baseline registration would have been a, a sexually orientated of, offense. Um, so 10 years, the, ju the prosecutor would have discretion to seek and the trial judge would have discretion to impose a sexual predator classification, which would have been a lifetime registration requirement. I agree under the facts of this case that that was probably an unlikely outcome. But of course, uh, as opposing counsel mentioned, this is a, uh, we are not dealing with an individual case. They are mounting a full scale frontal assault on Senate Bill 10. And so, uh, I perfectly understand, and I think this court recognized in, in Ferguson, that um, these type of registration laws will create uh, you know, public opprobrium. Um, they have since uh, the General Assembly passed Megan's Law in 1997. That well, has been counsel, wouldn't a full-scale frontal attack be an argument that the whole thing is unconstitutional and couldn't be applied to anybody? I'm sorry. I I, I didn't mean to suggest that they are saying that it cannot be applied to any of the folks that uh, any of the registered sex offenders in existence uh, as of the date of Senate Bill 10. So I apologize if I misspoke Mr. There. Lieberman, what's your most convincing argument that this does not constitute punishment if in fact that is your position? And that, that, is, that is my position. Um, if it is punishment, obviously uh, the law would be un 
unconstitutional under the ex post facto clause. And I think but, we can... But some will take a view that this has gotten to be such a longer period of time, for example, with respect to registration or the frequency of the registration, um, that it is becoming onerous and and should be properly characterized as punishment. What What is your most convincing argument uh, with respect to that, that view or that position? It is that the top tier of Senate Bill 10 requires an offender to register with his county sheriff four times a year. This was the same type of requirement that um, uh, this court reviewed in Cook and Ferguson, a quarterly registration requirement, and said that did not cross the, th the threshold. Um, and I, so I, th I think that is the, the best argument. When, if the General Assembly were to ever exceed that quarterly registration requirement, we would, have not, we would not have that line of precedence to rely on as strongly. And as to, I, th I think, the other point of your argument, as to has this transformed, does it, uh, has the, the remedial purpose sort of dropped out of the law? I think the answer is no. And I, um, I, the General Assembly doesn't need to do an empirical study when it passes the, a law, but th there is one study that both sides rely on. It was a broad-based empirical study out of the University of Michigan in, two th I think it was 2008, and the authors studied a number of jurisdictions and concluded that the uh, institution of sex offender registration prompted a significant decrease in the incidences of sex offenses. And um, that is certainly an... Uh, at least confirms the General Assembly's view that sex offender registration has an important purpose in protecting the community from these uh, Counsel, from these types under, of offenses. Counsel, if, if we were to find it punitive and therefore a violation of the um, application uh, or ex post facto, there's still uh, registration requirements on this class of people, correct? Uh, it's it's not clear, actually, Your Honor, because if it were... I thought I heard Ms. Zudi saying that her client was registering. Her client is registering right now. I, I'm, I don't know whether he's complying with Senate Bill 10 or whether that has been stayed in this action. Um, but if this court were to strike down Senate Bill 10, I think it would be an open question as to whether his Megan's Law classification revived. I, I, I don't... I think it's an open question. Because All right, let's say it does. Let's say we, we strike it down for uh, applicability here and um, uh, they're back to their original parameters of, of requirement for their, their classification. They're still registering. They're still registering, and if, if that is the case, if it is revived, the prosecutor would have the, uh, or may have the option to seek some sort of <clears throat> sexual predator classification as well, and all the other full panoply of of statutory provisions in Megan's law. I just, because Megan's law has been repealed by the General Assembly, I'm just not sure if that is an outcome in this case. Uh, we will. Well, my point is no, none of these offenders are um, going to just cease registering or doing what they're doing prior to the imposition of Senate Bill 10. That may be correct, Your Honor. I think there will be a color if this court strikes down the application of Senate Bill 10 to Mr. Williams and to other folks similarly situated. They may bring a colorable argument to this court that because the General Assembly has affirmatively repealed the old provisions under Megan's law, that they have absolutely no registration requirements uh, at all, and they don't need to comply with any anything. And I think that will be an openly. Uh, well, have we crossed that? On a, on a prior case, I don't remember the name of it, but. Uh, uh, we just had that issue recently. I, I, I be, right, I believe it was State versus Hodge, Your Honor, and I, th I actually think that the court said that there was no automatic revival, uh, and so that is so certainly an outcome that the state and the attorney general's office are extremely uh, wary of, that there could be a large group of offenders who don't have any registration requirements whatsoever, even, even under Megan's law. Uh, but, but that shouldn't drive our decision here. Of, yes, Your Honor. Okay. That should wait Thank for the next case. Much, Thank Mr. you, Your Honor. Ms. Sudi, you did not reserve any time for rebuttal. Um, or if you did, it slipped my mind. But you've used all your time, so I'll give you 30 you. minutes. Or 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> 30 seconds. I, I did reserve three minutes, but it, it had gone over. I just wanted to address very quickly the Attorney General's proposition that uh, offenders will have the argument that no restrictions will apply. That argument is contrary to both the United States Supreme Court 
and to the Ohio Revised Code. In Weaver v. Graham, the United States Supreme Court stated that the proper relief upon a conclusion that a state prisoner is being threatened under an ex post facto law is to remand to permit the state court to apply the law that is in place when his crime occurred. And also, Ohio Revised Code Section 1.58 has that protection within the Ohio Revised Code. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will take this matter under advisement and you will be notified of our opinion. Thank you very much.